Hello, everybody. I think you can all hear me. So welcome along to this session, the Oceania session. What are we, the Eastern Hemisphere? Um, we've got a range of talks today. They're fast, five minute talks with a little bit of space for questions and change over afterwards. And then we'll have some time, hopefully at the end, where we can go for a deeper dive into conversations and further questions. First off, uh, I'm speaking to you from Lutrawida, Tasmania, which is Aboriginal land, sea and waterways. And I acknowledge with deep respect the Muanina people, the traditional owners of this land on which I'm speaking to you from. The Muanina people cared for and protected country for thousands of years. They knew this land, they lived on this land and they died on this land, and I honour them. I pay my respects to elders past and present, to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status and to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. I recognise a history of truth which acknowledges the impacts of invasion and colonisation upon Aboriginal people, resulting in their forcible removal from their lands. I stand for a, for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights, paving the way for a strong future. I want to acknowledge the First Nation peoples of all of the lands that we're all from. So. With that said, first up, we have Daniel Silk presenting from uh, uh, Aotearoa, <laughs> maybe I can say it right, New Zealand, he's from Linz, so over to you, Daniel. Cool. Um, can I get my presentation up as the first question? I think Jonathan's onto that. Can you see my slides? Yep. Yes, did you need a verbal cue? <laughs> <laughs> cool, I did, thank cool. you very much. Um, cool, thanks Alex. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Daniel Silk uh, and I'm a product owner at the, in the topography team at Toy Toy Tefenua Land Information New Zealand. Um, it's great to be part of the event today. And a huge thanks to the organisers for providing a time slot that's friendlier for us in this part of the world. As a bit of background, uh, Toitu Te Whenua is the New Zealand government department that manages land titles, geodetic and cadastral survey systems, topographic information, hydrographic information and crown property. Um, our base maps product makes it fast and simple to create maps using our free, open and authoritative topographic data. This includes the development of vector tile services, but the lightning talk today will focus on our aerial imagery service. Um, we collate aerial imagery source from local and regional councils around New Zealand into a single national view. We provide WMTS and XYZ services so that our customers can easily bring aerial imagery into their maps. The service includes Sentinel-2 imagery at low zoom levels and then brings rural imagery uh, into view as you zoom in. This is 30 centimeter rural imagery outside of Wanaka. At the highest zoom levels in urban areas, we are showing five to 10 centimeter aerial imagery. This is five centimeter imagery in Christchurch. All up, there are over 130 individual aerial imagery surveys that have been combined to create this product, each consisting of thousands of individual TIFF files. Um, 40 of those are new imagery surveys that have been received since we launched this product a year and a half ago. So when the product team kicked off, we created some development principles. We needed the product to be low maintenance. The product team is small and cannot be burdened by having uh, to maintain a lot of infrastructure. It needs to be scalable. The system should be able to handle thousands of concurrent users. Highly available, should be no noticeable downtime for system upgrades or deployments. Open, the system uh, should be open to the public, use open standards and share its source code. It should be traceable, everything should be monitored and tracked so it, that when errors occur, they're easy to track, reproduce and fix. And low cost, as this is a consumption-based service, we pay the cost of serving the tiles, so the system needs to be cost effective. With these principles in mind, product development started by funding some GDAL enhancements. 
uh, while proof of concept work was being undertaken, we ended up with a script that ran a number of different GDAL commands in order to process our source imagery TIFFs into cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. We funded the creation of the GDAL COG driver as a convenient repo around the GeoTIFF driver to optimize and simplify this workflow. We have since contributed additional features, for example, uh, support for different compression, compression methods for the main image and overviews. So for our COG creation process, first our supplied TIFFs are stored in S3 with accompanying stack metadata so that we can process them in the cloud. Uh, this is an example of one of our source urban imagery, urban aerial imagery data sets. As you can see, it's quite spread out, um, covering different urban areas with almost 2,000 source files. We then determine the survey extent of all of the source files, source TIFFs. And we split the tiles into smaller processing groups that align to a tile matrix set, for example, Web, Web Mercator Quad or NZTM2000 Quad, which is our local projection coordinate reference system. Um, we are working with sparse data sets, which is quite challenging. We need some smarts to efficiently slice imagery into separate jobs for batch processing, and we need to optimize our COG creation so that COGs mostly contain data rather than empty space. This all gets quite complicated with different projections and different tile boundaries to align to. But we've built those algorithms into the process and can determine a processing queue, basically which TIFFs need to be processed to, to create an optimal set of COGs. We take that processing queue and create COGs on EC2 spot instances using AWS Batch. Uh, and new stack metadata is created during the process and also stored in S3 alongside the COGs. Imagery configuration files determine how the imagery is layered into the final product. To achieve our goals of system visibility and low maintenance, automated notifications are shared to Slack on job completion and automated pull requests are raised against the imagery configuration in GitHub. We can then view the newly processed set of imagery in the browser, make sure that everything looks good. So in order to serve this data to the users, we have our bucket containing COGS with stack metadata and sourced from the various aerial imagery surveys. Uh, we then have a Lambda function which combines and flattens those COGS into images based on our configuration logic. And we serve those images out to Basemaps users. So onto some stats from our production service. We've served over 2 billion tiles since launch a year and a half ago. In the first couple of weeks, our service was shared on Reddit, which caused a peak of 2,000 requests per second. Uh, which the system handled fine, and 99% of all tiles are composed in under 300 milliseconds. That's all I have time to share today. You can view our service at basemaps.lens.gov.nz. Uh, you can find the source code on GitHub, and you can contact us via email, or we'll be in the GitHub chat to answer questions. Um, finally, a huge thank you to everyone that has contributed to the open source technologies and the open standards that our service uses. We couldn't have created this product without your efforts. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Daniel. I'm uh, impressed that you managed to survive the Reddit hug of death, notorious <laughs> hug of death. Um, have we got any questions bouncing around on the Gitter? We do not. I'll pause for a little while. I'll just um, to let everybody know if you can join Gitter to ask your questions. And I think I can send I'm not sure how to message everybody, but um, if you do put questions into the, the chat, then I'll try to respond to those as well. Cool, we'll stick around there as well. Cool, thanks, Daniel. Um, great talk, fantastic. So next up, we have Pavel Dorovsky from Carbon Matter. Uh, did I say that? Hello. Carbon. Carbon Matter. Yeah, carbon Matter. Yeah. <laughs> cool, so over to you. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. I'm sure Jonathan's working on it. So you have been given uh, presenter rights. Uh, you might, okay. if you're working off of a Mac, you might need to log out and jump back in. Uh, I should have permissions. I'm just, just looking for a button, I think. There's a green button with a screen underneath the camera. Is that the one? It would be um, at the top to the right of the camera button, the show screen. Should have practiced this. 
Uh, do you need to pop out the side panel with the orange button? I see the... So it's in the control panel and not in your video sort of view. Okay. I have my video, but I don't see... Now we can see you. Yeah. So... Have you got the go to webinar control panel visible? Yes, I do I see it visible. There's a bunch of buttons on it. They're not labeled, unfortunately. So I think, is it in that, is it in that webcam section? I can't see it at the moment. You might try that top orange button. I think then it'll get labels on stuff. That's what I was trying to say. The orange button closes the panel and then opens it back up. There you go. Change presenter show. Yeah, I think one of those little tabs in there has like four different, like share screen, something, something, something. something. Is there a window? Um... Is there anything from the drop down that can go to that's easy to follow? So you should, you should say, is there a sharing uh, panel in there? Audio window webcams. Yeah. Window. What about in window? Yes, I do have a window. Yes. Window enter full screen. Ah. Uh. Show tab bar. Yeah, from my side, also, I don't see the... Yeah, sure. no, one, no one sees it except the person who is presenting. Yep. We're going to try and give you presenter again, Pavel. There we go. So you should get a prompt, I, I hope. I see sharing my screen prompt, yes. You can see it now? Uh, I clicked the button, but can do you see my screen? No. You That's just have the... to choose which, which panel, I think. Which thing okay, can you try again? And I'll just maybe I, I have there was a drop down on top. Maybe I have to pick that. Yep, we'll try this one more time. Okay, one more time, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Shell drop down. Okay. Beach ball. Great. Okay, yes. The, I had to click the drop down. Okay, we're there. Yes. I'm going to share one of my screens. It's a good idea. Sure which one it is. You see something. Okay, great. Okay. Well, Beautiful. I apologize for the four minutes uh, taking up uh, <laughs> of my presentation. Um, no worries at all. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, Carbon Mapper is a coalition of uh, multiple organizations. Uh, such as Planet, uh, JPL, uh, Arizona State University, and some other organizations. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to map all of the uh, uh, methane and carbon emissions on the planet. On the planet, so it's a it's a pretty lofty goal. You know, we plan to have uh, 30 satellites in orbit. Uh, the satellites are going to be uh, controlled by Planet, and Carbon Mapper is in charge of basically ingesting, processing, and doing the work of detecting plumes so that um, the emissions can be mitigated. So, um, so it, it turns out that the majority of the emissions come from a sm small percentage of actual plumes. So this is some quick visualizations. Um, and you know, if, if basically we detect, uh, we have good coverage, we uh, identify the biggest plumes, uh, we can very easily mitigate uh, the majority of the emissions that happen, and as um, and, and the methane is one of the you know biggest contributors to uh, much much more much bigger contributor than CO two to the uh, global warming effect. So, um, so got brushing ahead a little bit here. Um, so we have uh, a lot of historical data. So this is not a brand new mission. You know we have uh, sensors. Uh, that were collecting hyperspectral data from uh, airborne missions going back to 2015. So uh, Carbon Mapper is new, and 
I am basically uh, working on building data platform to incorporate all the previous research work and accommodate future mission of the satellite launch, basically. So the historical data from Airborne is about 100 terabytes um, from 2015 to 2021. And uh, there's a lot of stages of processing to the data, you know, from the hyperstructural data where we have 432 bands, uh, it gets reduced down to uh, just a few bands of uh, that indicate the actual sort of concentration of CO2 and uh, methane. So, you know, we're using AWS uh, cloud uh, right now, S3 for storing the data. And uh, we're gonna use various tools to basically dynamically process this uh, at a scale uh, as the uh, scale, basically the satellite constellation scales up. So, but right now we're basically practicing on the airborne data. So, but even with that data, it's, it's quite large, you know, uh, we might want to reprocess uh, some of this historical data as we test new code, for example. Uh, and there's all sorts of other things happening uh, because the airborne data keeps coming in. There's actually uh, going to be few, uh, sorry, more, more flights ongoing, basically. So perpetually, we're going to be adding 30 terabytes of uh, airborne data a year. And the satellite data, I can't really say how much it's going to be but it's going to be a magnitude larger volume. Uh, so it's a very large data set. So uh, the way that the stack is really helping us is actually categorizing and exposing the access to the data via the stack API as opposed to file system, which is what a lot of researchers are used to. So uh, if you, if you uh, you know, think about how traditionally uh, this research has happened. You know, people have worked with the file systems in the cluster at, you know, JPL or NASA, and those things have worked at a certain scale. But, you know, as, as we are going to uh, scale up a lot more, we really have to think about things in more encapsulated fashion. And Stack API is basically a fantastic standard to, uh, to start to implement uh, as part of the existing operations and uh, as part of the framework going forward. So basically, you know, we have both manual data generated by users and we have automatic data ingestion going on at the same time. And we're going to be triggering uh, workflows based on these inputs. And we want to reuse as many stack tools as possible. So we want uh, all of the AWS batch and step functions uh, calling stack API search and uh, accessing analysis rated data as opposed to, uh, you know, rely on FOSS and things like that, because uh, that approach old fashioned would just not even work. Um, so this is the, the basic architecture that I can present and that, um, you know, we have the spatial temporal asset catalog as basically the sort of the fundamental uh, piece of the entire infrastructure. And, you know, around that, it, it powers uh, also, also all things around it, such as the processing pipeline, the data services for data consumers who are going to be uh, consuming the products that we generate and, you know, web visualization as well. Uh, so some of our users are going to be, you know, CARB California, uh, Air Resource Board, uh, but they're also hopefully, you know, we're going to have other consumers and regulators that uh, is all kind of in planning stages right now. But that's the goal. You know, the, the goal is to basically expose uh, the methane emissions data so that uh, multiple organizations around the world can uh, use it to regulate and prevent emissions going forward in the future. So it's going to be highly impactful mission. So. That's pretty much it. Sorry about taking up all the time. <laughs> Great. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel. It sounds like a really interesting project. And I, I think um, that merging of uh, the you know, satellite data and um, aerial imagery and drone data is um, a really interesting space.
Uh, we got any questions coming in for Pavel? So Ryan Abernathy, I think this is more of a comment, says methane is a bigger contributor to greenhouse warming per unit mass, but the total CO2 radiative forcing is much larger because there is much more CO2 emissions. Not sure if you want to respond to that one, Pavel. No, oh, sure. No, I think that's a very, very valid point. Um, and we are going to be mapping uh, CO2 plumes as well. So it's a carbon mapper, you know, it does have carbon names. So uh, we're going to be looking at both. Uh, so far, methane has been kind of the easiest target because of the airborne emissions, but uh, we're going to be mapping both. Um, and we're concentrating on plumes and things that we can prevent. The issue with, I think, with the sort of more background and dispersed uh, emissions is that it's it's harder to map with hyperspectral. So um, there's different, I think there's different approaches to reducing it. And I think the from what I understand, what the scientists are saying, it, methane is kind of the lowest methane uh, emissions from landfills and oil producers, pipelines are kind of the lowest hanging fruits. Some of them emit so much, so much methane that they can fix with just a few phone calls. Uh, that it is, it is pretty uh, egregious, basically. And uh, there are some yeah, articles sure. about it that I can share. Yep. Cool. Great. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation, Pavel. Sure. Uh, and uh, the next presenter is me, so I get the, the uh, privilege of introducing myself. Uh, and I'm going to share this screen over here. So you're seeing what I want you to see? Yep. All right. All right, I'm going to dive in. So my name is Alex Leith. I work at Geoscience Australia, I currently work on the Digital Earth Africa project. Digital Earth Africa's vision is around providing routine, reliable and operational service using Earth observations to deliver decision ready products, enabling policymakers, scientists, the private sector and civil society to address social, environmental and economic changes on the continent and develop an ecosystem for innovation across sectors. It's pretty hand wavy, nice and fluffy kind of introduction. What I like to think of is that we are making Earth observation data more easily accessible uh, over all of Africa, not just continental, but the islands too. And I think that the way that this project is run, so I, I work on Digital Earth Australia, I used to as well. And Digital Earth Australia was founded on uh, getting the Landsat data, unlocking the Landsat data, uh, and the first project was literally called Unlocking the Landsat Archive. And back in the past, analysis ready data wasn't really an agreed on thing. And so getting that data that was captured from the satellite, turning it into something that is um, analysis ready, making that accessible was a really big deal. And the way that we did that is through lots of net CDFs on a file system. We're at a completely different paradigm now in that having all the data accessible all at once through essentially HTTP API is where it's at. So we used to have a supercomputer which you had to get permission to join on and, and be able to read the file system and think about all of that while you did it. Now you can just access all of the TIFFs anytime from anywhere in the world when you look at the USGS uh, Landsat repository. Software was really hard to install, complex, bespoke, written from scratch in uh, the case of the Australian Geoscience Data Cube. Uh, these days, there's standardized data science tools. People talk about Pangeo. Everybody's kind of used it. A lot of people know what a notebook is and launch it and use the same tools. When we're doing remote sensing using Python, practically everybody's using X-Ray. When it comes to science, uh, local, difficult to reproduce science, data on your laptop, uh, bespoke little tiny net CDFs of your case study area. These days we're doing collaborative data science, uh, teams of scientists working the same way using Git, uh, code reviews, a whole bunch of software paradigms, but scientists are doing it and it's a fantastic way to be sharing, um, standing on each other's shoulders and, and collaborating. So. In terms of cloud native, we don't produce analysis ready data, we store it. 
Digital Earth Africa does. So we have a, a couple of buckets in S3 in Cape Town in South Africa, where we store and manage and maintain over three petabytes of data. One of our biggest products is uh, Landsat data that we get from the USGS. And the way that we get that is these cloud native things. So they send uh, an AWS SNS notification. SNS stands for Simple Notification Services. It really is just like a ping that you can subscribe to. It has a little bit of JSON in it, and that says there's a new scene that the USGS has uh, produced. We grab that scene, stick it on, or stick that notification on a queue. We shift all of the cogs to South Africa. Uh, we update the stack metadata that they produce to point to our bucket, and then we create our, our own notification, which says to us, here's the scene in our bucket. And that's public, so people out in the community can subscribe to that notification and do whatever they want. But we subscribe to it, so we, we dog food these notifications and we index it into the open data queue and create some scene-based derivative products on it, um, basically as soon as we can in real time. What that means is that in February, on February 10th uh, this year, USGS released Landsat 9 data. The next day, it was available in Digital Earth Africa in Cape Town with the data down there. Um, we, I basically had to edit a, a bit of configuration that said include this sensor as well as Landsat 5, 7, and um, 8. And we, um, we have the data, it's there. So another aspect of big data is being able to access all that data. So uh, talking about kind of, um, so this is, so I want to talk about this analysis here. So this is the geometric median. Um, the input to this is 65,000 Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 scenes that cover 2021 over all of Africa, as you can see on the right there. We want to produce a cloud-free summary of those. So for a given region of interest, find all of the scenes, mask out all the clouds, uh, work out the middle observation, the median pixel, uh, it's a synthetic observation, uh, write that out, throw away the rest. So you basically touch every single pixel. We are able to do this over the entire year, 65,000 scenes on 70 spot instances in less than an hour and compute cost is less than 100 US dollars. Being able to move this fast, uh, so we were able to do that within two weeks of the Landsat 9 data being available. Being able to move this fast is simply not possible on um, without using the cloud. This is what it looks like. This is the kind of resource consumption that uses 14 terabytes of RAM. Again, it only cost us 100 bucks because we only used it for an hour. And we get this beautiful image on the right at 30 meter resolution over wherever there is Landsat. And up close, it looks really pretty. What I'm really proud of is that it's not just the kind of data science cloud engineer people that can do this kind of analysis. We are able to um, get our science um, folks doing it too. So we've got a continental crop mask at 10 meter resolution, which for every pixel says yes, no, and the prob uh, probability between zero and one of whether that pixel is cropping land. Um, it took a year to develop the method and run the first region. There's eight regions in total. The last region took a week to basically um, uh, to basically produce, and we we're able to rerun the entire uh, thing, it's continental 10 meters, in about a week. Uh, another really cool. So this is crop mask on the right. Uh, another really cool yeah, product. Yeah. You're running a little long. Uh, I'm going too long. All right, I'm going to skip over this. Um, our science guys can do some really cool stuff. And it's pretty. So check out, um, ask me later and I'll talk about it more. Uh, how about I stop there? You can read the conclusions, ask me questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm sorry I went too long. Uh, Ryan's asking asking about Argo workflows, and I um I do want to say that I love Argo. Argo is a fantastic workflow tool. The way that we use it now is for a big data processing job. We put we put tasks on a queue, and then we run 
X um, con uh, containers that have been templated by Argo, and they sort of take the jobs off the queue and, and do them. But we've got I've got a whole bunch of different um, uh, example scripts that we run with Ar Argo, so Python scripts in a Docker container, and uh, a range of example Argo workflows. Some that we run um, like routinely every seven minutes or an hour, and somewhere we we do it once as a get data from here, uh, change it, write it out there. Um, Argo is great. It's a fantastic way of, of of stepping back from the detail of Kubernetes a little bit and making it really easy to use. Matt has asked what the difference between a geo median and just calculating a per band median value is. And I, I don't actually know the, the answer to that, but it's, it's I, I actually can't explain it very well. Sorry, Matt. I'm, I have to defer to someone with more knowledge than me. Um, plus, I've had the microphone for too long. So let's um, hand over next to Dimitri. Um, and if Jonathan can set up his screen sharing, that would be fantastic. How are you going there, Dimitri? Yeah, and I thank you. Just let me figure out how to share my screen. Cool. Um, all right, yeah, I will keep this uh, presentation a little bit less formal compared to previous one because, um, yeah, I, I want to make it interactive. And uh, um, in our in in my talk, I will focus on like data scientist perspective on the geospatial analytics and especially AI and computer vision problems. So um, yeah, I'm Dimitri. I'm founder of Rexi, where we build. Lost audio. Uh, yeah, I think we've lost your audio, Dimitri. Can you hear us still? Uh, I can see that your microphone is still on. We can still see your screen, but we can't hear you. Hmm. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we got you now. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's related to, to the ability of this software to automatically adjust the call volume. So it's kind of reducing uh, the input. Uh, where can I fix it? You sound fine now. So I think you should just yeah, okay. Um. Yeah, so at Rexi, we built a platform for no code or low code AI and satellite and aerial images. Um, namely, it allow domain experts and uh, business users to annotate a couple of objects um, on satellite or aerial images and then write on the browser to train um, AI models and then run this on larger scale. And um, the cloud optimized DOT is really the core technology which enables all our workflows. Now let's uh, try to get a step back and uh, take a look on the challenges which typical data scientists face first when, when work on, on the computer vision problems on geospatial data on satellite images. First of all, the um, images are really huge and typically you cannot process the whole image in, in one pass, so people make chunks of images and then process each uh, small grid and then combine the results together in order to, for example, detect objects or detect buildings. But in reality, things are a little bit more complicated because um, when you divide image into chunks, there could be some border effects where your AI model uh, won't be able to detect the objects on the border. So typically people do chunks with overlap and uh, where this is where things are getting complicated because you need to resolve um, a lot of collisions. Um, 
And you can imagine that working with the just GOT files is a big mess because you need to manage all these small chunks somewhere on the disk and uh, clean up and so on and so forth. And later on, I will show um, how we adapted uh, Cloud Optimized GOT to run all this analysis of analysis on the fly without um, need to, to manage all these uh, smaller files on this. Um, the next part is the uh, geospatial specific of the data and uh, namely projections um, which can surprise the people outside of um, geospatial and the very same image may look uh, very different for, for human and for, for algorithm for computer vision model and that can affect performance. So uh, we need to account this as well. And thanks to, again, to cloud-optimized GeoTip and the GDAL, we can do that on the fly. And uh, I will demonstrate later uh, how smooth it can be. And the last part, um, which we will touch here in the presentation, is the resolution or ground sample distance. And for example, if, if you have your uh, models detecting cars work on 50 centimeter per pixel, uh, satellite data, it might not work on the high resolution drone images with the five centimeter per pixel because just your um, object which your model expects to see are much smaller. Um, and now uh, I wanted to just demonstrate um, the workflow which is powered by cloud optimized GeoTIF, um, which um, solved all these uh, issues uh, I mentioned before. Um, yeah, basically, um, in the platform we are built, we make it really simple to, to run um, analytics on the cloud apps in IGOT. So if you store your images somewhere in the cloud, you can just provide a URL uh, uh, to this image. And um, thanks to the way how cloud optimized GeoTIFs are organized, they can be efficiently streamed and uh, no need to copy data. So you can um, run your analytics like in real time. So I provided the URL to GeoTIF, then I can select the model, for example, I want to detect cars, and then um, all the cars will be detected in like the seconds. So you don't need to copy anything anywhere. And th I think that's the whole point of having the cloud optimized formats and the tools around uh, uh, cloud optimized GeoTIF to make it really smooth. Um, yeah, so it took about 20 seconds to detect all the objects. And now I wanted to, to share the last last part. So sometimes it's okay to, to run the analysis um, offline, but there are um, events, for example, these disasters when every every minute counts. And um, Maxar, for example, have a program <clears throat> related to natural disasters. So after flooding or some huge event happens, they uh, share the high resolution data free of charge which you can directly uh, use. And it, it is already in the analysis ready format, in a Coke format. And um, uh, we made a proof of concept where you can just copy a link to, to the um, Coke file shared on the, uh, with the Maxar. Actually, they are stored on AWS S3. And then you can um, detect damages uh, right from your browser without need to, to do any, any engineering. Uh, so what we do, we just copy URLs from Maxar Open Data to to what is built on our platform, and then in a, like three minutes you can get uh, all the images um, detected right from your uh, browser, and um, disaster response team can um, make a quicker uh, um, actions on the on the damage. Um, yeah, that's pretty it. I think I'm running out of time, so it will take yeah. about three minutes to finish uh, this huge area of like 
about 2,000 square symmetry. kilometers. But, uh, but um, yeah, just uh, summarizing, cloud optimized GeoTIF is a really enabler of the uh, real time analytics. It's not a, just a format for visualizing your data. It is much more, and in future we will see more and more applications which leverage cloud optimized format for real time analytics. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dimitri. That's a really cool application. Do we have any questions rolling around for Dimitri? I don't see any on Gitter. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much again. Uh, oh, there's a couple of notes on here. Uh, custom models. So, Dimitri, can someone bring their own model along to your platform? Yeah, there are two options. <laughs> Either you can train. Uh... Your audio stopped again, I think. Yeah, there are two options. Uh, so either you can train your custom model to detect custom objects right on the platform and then in one click deploy. Or yeah. if you have your own models, you can use an SDK and you can essentially upload like ONLX file to the platform and uh, the platform will take care of like, distributing workload and teaching results back. Yeah, so we, we cool. do support. Great. Oh, well, let's, let's leave that one there. Thank you very much again. And um, Thank you. Jonathan, next up, uh, we're moving on to Cyrus Pante. I think I'm pronouncing that name okay. So that's a, we have a video for this one. Good day, everyone. I am Nico Pante. I am part of the newly established space agency of the country, PILSA. I am going to give a lightning talk about a project we are working on called Tiwata Fuji's Browser. The country made its presence in space by launching two multispectral Earth observation microsatellites named Diwata 1 and Diwata 2. They were initiated by two programs prior to PILSA's establishment in 2019, PHL Microsat and Stamina for Space. The image on the right is the flight model of Diwata 2. The Wata 1 has, this has been decommissioned in 2020. The Wata 2 is still in orbit, and since last October last year, it has been able to capture 72,000 images and has covered 85% of the total land cover of the Philippines. This image shows the post eruption capture of Taal Volcano in 2020. We want to make these images more accessible. Our vision is to be able to search, visualize, and load these images in a GIS environment. We are developing the Diwata Fuji's browser, the one shown right now. It is simply a Fuji's plugin that will let users do those mentioned functions for Diwata images. It looks like the first iteration of the Fuji stack browser. However, we plan to have more control of the interface and direct our users more easily by providing them already with inputs such as the catalog endpoint. This plugin is also built using the Fuji plugin builder. We leverage stack to index the Diwata images and stack API to search and serve the images. The plugin has a pre-setting of our stack catalog. Uh, currently, there are only three filters, the collection, the temporal and spatial extent. We are current, currently serving only one collection for demonstration. The spatial extent can be chosen as map extent, which will filter the results based on the map extent on the main Fuji's window. The filtered stock items are returned. The stock allows to easily display the information 
or metadata without saving it. The stock assets such as the image thumbnail that rides with the item can be also be loaded as a preview. Another asset of the stock item is the, the Cloud Optimized Duty or COG. Uh, currently, this asset can be downloaded and and be loaded in the Q, the QGIS environment. Our plan is to leverage with COG by streaming the images directly to the GIS, a uh, sort of a visualize on the fly. We also hope to be able to download parts of the images when extent inputs are available such as the map extent of the main window or if there is an available polygon layer in the environment. Stock and COG can be used to speed up the workflow by letting users explore and load data straight to a GIS application. We can also use the environment to supply for our stock search, such as the map extent. The image is also directly loaded, which removes data preparation processes such as image corrections, making data ready for analysis. Finally, it has also helped in our programs to demonstrate our capabilities in making applications and distributing data especially we are young in the space industry thank you all for listening well thank you uh thank you very much cyrus and cyrus is uh here live with us so if there are any thank questions you. from folks um, I don't see any questions online, um, but you've got satellites up in space and capturing imagery. So that was that was an image from the satellite that you showed us. Is that right? Uh, yes. Sir. That's pretty exciting. So how um yeah. how often how frequently do you get images over the Philippines from the satellite? Uh the satellite has a uh, uh, pass of 16 days well, cool. uh, after a pass in the Philippines. So it will return after uh, approximately 16, 16 days. days. Yes. Awesome. Oh, I'd love to have a look at some of the data sometime. Um, no further questions. I think we can move on to the next presenter, please, Jonathan. So next up, we have uh, Emmanuel Mato uh, from Terraju. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad to present you the culmination of more than a year of development using cloud native technologies for the Disaster Charter Initiative. The mission of the International Charter of Space and Major Disasters is to facilitate the acquisition and the delivery of Earth observation data at no cost to support disaster management and humanitarian relief operations in areas of the world affected by natural or man-made disaster. This initiative involves 15 space agencies and link a constellation of 42 satellites, 33 Earth observation missions, and with different sensor type, optical radar, altimetry meteorology. In this framework, uh, the Earth observation data received from the charter members is provided to the end user via a, a charter operational system managed by European Space Agency. It coordinates the delivery of maps from the value adder providers to the end user and cooperating bodies as appropriate. Since 2007, ESA has been involved to augment the system with an online processing environment to facilitate the access and the processing of big volumes of EO data provided by the charter members. And we at Teradue were selected by the European Space Agency to design and operate a new online service to visualize the satellite acquisition at full resolution. And after almost a year of intensive development, a new portal named ESA Charter Mapper was officially open to support charter operations, and in particular, the product screening activities. 
Product screening requires the production of high-resolution RGB composites from acquisitions of all satellites of the constellation with many different metadata and data formats. This first challenge was tackled with the metadata harmonization for all missions. Fortunately, during the development phase, a promising common metadata language called TAC and dedicated to special temporal assets was emerging, and we took the chance to use it extensively. Indeed, Stack provides the abstraction layer and reduces the UData heterogeneity by defining a synthetic interface to data, highlighting the concept of assets supporting cloud meta types in single or multiband enclosure, as you can see currently in this recorded demo of a disaster activation workspace. The Charter Mapper development contributed directly to new standards by providing useful extension to manage satellite characteristics, instrument specificities, processing lineage, or raster information. Behind the portal is deployed a cloud native platform with several components integrating the latest state of the art technology. Of course, it all starts with a special temporal asset catalog for indexing all the metadata of the acquisition. Then all the data is processed to cloud-optimized GeoSafe raster, allowing the cocktailer service to display, to display various asset selections. And finally, all the components are deployed on a Kubernetes infrastructure to support the massive processing at scale. At this stage, the multi-mission product screening is the main use case of the charter mapper and thus requires pre-processing of the satellite acquisition to have analysis-ready dataset to allow an homogeneous visualization and ready to process data of the different satellite imagery and the usage of downstream and value-adding services such as change detection of fire. The current demo shows you a third-party service developed with partners at Teradue. We can see that the asset granularity and the COG visualization allows the project manager of the disaster activation to select efficiently the data to be processed. Typically here, a pre- and post-fire event acquisition to extract a fire change detection result delineating a burnt area in the region affected by the disaster. Basically, each remote sensing scene is calibrated to a common processing level. Optical dataset are transformed to top of atmosphere or surface reflectance values for each of the spectral bands. And SAR datasets are converted to sigma zero backscatter value in all available polarization. Then a large portfolio of downstream services is provided to the users for, from those analysis ready datasets. Flood mapping, hotspot, lava flow, and active fire detection, burned area delineation and intensity, pan sharpening, multi sensor band composition, optical spectral indices, qualitative stacking, SAR amplitude change, or yet interferometry. This project demonstrates the maturity of the previously listed technologies to implement a comprehensive cloud native platform with optimized data access and processing for an operational usage of satellite imagery. This is a fundamental basis for rapid response in the context of the disaster charter. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day. Bye bye. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. And comprehensive indeed. That's pretty impressive suite of capabilities within the platform there. And a pretty shiny presentation at the start too. I need to get a graphic designer helping me out. Um, uh, Emmanuel is not available for questions. So I think we'd best move on. But if you've got a question for him, post it on Twitter and um, hopefully he'll be around uh, in the daytime in Europe to uh, help out to respond. So next up, we have our final presentation from Hamed Ali Mohammed uh, from Radiant Earth. So Jonathan, please push go. Hi everyone, my name is Hamed Ali Mohammed. I'm the Chief Data Scientist and Executive Director with Radiant Earth Foundation. Today I'm going to talk about how we use a stack to create reproducible machine learning workflows, uh, particularly on Radiant ML Hub. If you consider a machine learning modeling cycle, you usually start with a set of training data. Uh, which in the case of supervised modeling contains a source data and a label uh, data. Uh, you train a machine learning model, uh, then you deploy that model and generate predictions uh, over a new area, or you might use your test uh, collection of data 
and evaluate the performance of the model. Uh, using the metrics derived from this, uh, you might go back to improve uh, your training data in terms of representation and distribution, or use a different architecture and deploy and train another machine learning model. Um, and this cycle continues until you come up with an acceptable level of accuracy for the model, and you go after then publishing your model. When we talk about reusability and reproducibility of these workflows, I mean, for example, you might pick an existing model, uh, combine that with new labels and new source imagery, and train a new machine learning model on top of that. This might be a fine tuning for a new geospatial location or a time period, uh, and then deploy that to generate new predictions or inference. Or you might go after just reproducing the results of that existing model to see how it performs over your area of interest, for example, without any fine tuning. Uh, to ensure the reusability and reproducibility workflows, we need to publish the ML models using an uh, inclusive met set of metadata and collections, and also enable search and query for those, in addition to the publication of the training data. And today I'm going to talk about a stack of uh, stack ML extensions, uh, particularly the ML model extension that enables cataloging machine learning models, and the label extension, which is uh, for uh, publication and cataloging of geospatial training data sets. Uh, so the label extension, as you see in this table, which is the item properties, covers a set of property that are applicable specifically for labeled data sets. Uh, this can include uh, a generic uh, properties, uh, classes that particularly are applied to categorical uh, labeled data sets, a description, a type of label, uh, and at this time, a label extension supports both vector and raster type of labels, uh, and other uh, kind of optional properties here. Uh, this is an example of a stack label item uh, for a training data set on, on ML Hub. Uh, you can see we have a set of properties. Uh, we have label classes, for example. This is a various types of crop types in this uh, label, uh, a description. The type of label in this case is a vector data set. Uh, we have assets, which include the documentation, as well as the actual label.json, which is the uh, polygons of the label data set. Then we have a geometry, and then we have uh, a set of links, uh, including the typical uh, collection and parent link, as well as a source link. Uh, this is a special uh, kind of link uh, for the label extension, which links the label collection to a source collection. So when we talk about label data set, you usually generate a label on top of a source imagery or a generic input data. Uh, and a requirement in the label collection or the label extension is you need to link to the source collection. So in this case, we are, for example, linking to the stack item for the source imagery that was used to generate the labels here. Uh, this is a relationship between two stack collections, basically. And the, usually the query happens on the label collection. And when the user lands on a, a required or a preferred label item, then they can find a corresponding source item uh, and start using that data. Then on the model extension, uh, we have, again, various types of uh, fields, uh, the model type, uh, the learning approach, the prediction type, architecture, and so on. And the goal has been how we can ensure that we have the right metadata that the user can reproduce this model or reuse it. Uh, most of these properties are derived from a community conversation and a hackathon we have uh, ran last year and a continued conversation on GitHub and our Slack channel with various users and interested groups. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to join that conversation. This is, a, for example, a stack uh, model item, a sample from an existing model on ML Hub. You see in the links, for example, we have a Docker image uh, that is for inferencing. So you can use that to run the model for inferencing. Uh, we have a relationship to the training data set in this case. So the model is trained on an existing data set, and that data set has a stack collection. We link it here, so there is this relationship again between the model and the uh, training data set. We have the source data collection, the labels collection, and the actual data set. Then we have the assets, which in this case includes the model checkpoint. So the final model weights and the checkpoint from the training is included, as well as the Docker Compose file, which is used for inferencing. Um, on ML Hub, uh, we use both of these extensions and we provide a, a large number of training data sets and models now that you can access either through the website or through our Stack API, uh, which also has a Python client around it and we can use it natively in Python uh, to find and query existing data sets and models uh, or download them and use them. Uh, so I encourage you to check out mlhub.earth uh, and check out the existing catalogs that we have. 
Uh, one final uh, call is a community conversation around the stack label extension. We know it's a growing uh, uh, use case for various groups who are working on the machine learning application. So we would like to have a, a kind of uh, chat about this uh, extension, how we can improve it, what are the use cases that it needs to support, and how it should basically evolve over the following year. So if you're interested, please join us this coming Friday. Uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. UTC. Uh, the details will be a Zoom meeting that we'll post in our uh, Slack channel. Uh, please join ML Hub Slack, join and Bitly, uh, and we can share the uh, basically details there. Uh, come up with any use cases, any issues you have using label extension, or ideas in terms of how it should be improved. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Hamid. Um, He's not online for questions, uh, but I certainly want to talk to him about sharing some models. We have a model around our crop mask that I want to share, training data and a model. So I'll um, follow up with him. Uh, thanks, Renee, for sharing the link uh, on GitHub for that uh, workshop on Friday. Um, we are two minutes over time, but since there's no sessions afterwards, I'm happy to open up for a bit of a conversation with whoever's here, and if anybody has any questions, please put them on Gitter or through the GoToWebinar interface. Um, I think you might be able to raise your hand. Is that right, Jonathan? And um, have your audio opened up too? That's correct. Anybody that has a, a question live, they can raise their hand and I will unmute them. Getting kind of late for everybody else. Maybe they're too tired yeah. to ask questions. Yep. Well. Oh. No, just more discussion on some of the other topics. Yeah. So it's just a little bit of chat on Gita. So look, we might, since we're just over time, I think we might as well leave it there. Thank you very much for coming along. And for those that watch the video later, thanks for paying attention. Um, and thanks to Chris Holmes for putting this together. It's been really great. Cheers. Thank you all. Thanks, Will.